Hey there, it's Chris from Good Rose, and I am in the process of building a low-tech DIY snowboard. In the last video, I laminated and profiled my core, and I teased a little something something I've been working on. Because the next step is to drill my core for binding inserts, and in order to do that, I've designed this guy right here. So, let's get into it. Fresh out of the planer, my core is smooth and tapered, with one flat side and one side that has a slight curve to it. In order to get my binding mounts in the right place, I need to establish a center line on my core. My favorite way to do that is with a carpenter's combination square. It's a simple method that doesn't require much thinking, and you also don't need a long straight edge. Here's how you do it. You measure the width of the thing you want the center of, divide that number in half, and set the square to that length. Then you draw a line at that setting from both sides of your board, or core, or whatever. And if the lines match each other, the square is set for your center. Oh dang, that's pretty spot on. Great. If the two marks don't quite line up, just adjust the square bit by bit until they match each other. You gotta remember that your line is being offset some just based on the width of the writing implement that you're using. Then, since you know your line is even, you can just drag the combination square along the edge of your stock, marking the center line as you go. And there you go. Now you got a reference for the middle of your core. The next thing I did was give myself reference lines at the sort of knuckles of the core profile, where the profile of my board transitions from the flat center into the tapers at the nose and tail. And then I also gave myself sort of rough marks of where my riding stance is. That's what all this bouncing is about. I'm getting my feet a comfortable width apart and eyeballing those positions for sort of reference marks. And I'll be using those marks to locate my binding mounting patterns. I got my core up on some scrap board so I don't drill through my bench, and now it's time to introduce you to the star of the show. Meet the Ice Bug, the newest tool in the Good Roads Collective board building arsenal. I've been working on this little guy since the snowboard I built last year, and I went through a lot of different possible solutions for locating the guide, locking it in place, accommodating the different steps and drilling processes involved, and none of them worked particularly well. It turns out snowboards are way more complicated to drill than skateboards. The best method I came up with was just to use pilot holes and then drill from either side for the flange and threaded section of the binding inserts. But unlike my Scarab skateboard drilling guides, the locating pins needed for the pilot holes needed to be pretty thin, and 3D printing just wasn't giving me strong enough parts to feel confident selling them to you guys. I'm trying to get you good stuff out here, so I felt really stuck for a while, until I found a source for these. These metal pins unlock the potential for a robust guide that lets you quickly, easily, and accurately drill pilot holes for your binding inserts. And in keeping with my insect theme, the guide is named after one of the few insects that thrives in ice and snow. Ugly looking buggers. So here it is, the Good Roads Ice Bug Drilling Guide. Now available at goodroadscollective.com slash shop. There'll be a link down below. Okay, okay, enough blah blah blah. Let me show you how it works. First, remove one or both of the locating pins and get it positioned in the place where you want your binding inserts. I'm eyeballing mine, but if you want to be more precise, there's a tick mark at one end of the guide that lines up with the center of the outermost holes. You can use that to get really accurate measurements. Next, move the guide side to side until you can sight the center line of your board through the gap in the middle of the guide. The guide is designed to drill 5 32nd inch holes, which is about 4 mil for our friends across the pond, so chuck one of them bad boys in your drill, hold the guide in place, and drill your first hole. Snag your first pin and drop it through the guide into the hole you just drilled. This begins to lock the guide in place, but this arrangement is much longer than the drilling pattern for a skateboard, and there are also a lot more holes, so I thought a second pin would really help out. Let's slide that bad boy out. Drill a second hole at the opposite side of the guide and drop in the second pin. This really locks the guide in place. That, that ain't going nowhere. 
And with it pinned in place, you can basically turn off your brain and run through the rest of the holes super quickly. This gives you a perfect industry standard 2x4 mounting pattern every time. The pins fit back in the end of the guide with a friction fit, ready for next time. Which in this case is right now. Drill. Pin one. Drill. Pin two. Then go wild. Nice. And then looking at this, I had a crazy idea. I've seen a couple boards out there drilled with an extra set of mounts so that you can set your bindings way back towards the tail for those glorious deep powder days. And I realized I could easily use this guide to expand on the standard drilling template that I had initially planned. I used the locating pins to lock it into my existing pattern and drilled an extra set of deep pow day holes. I love when stuff like this happens. When I design a tool and it accidentally has more utility than I planned for, that's that's just the best. Chef's kiss. Now, this is supposed to be a low tech build, so before I go on, I just wanna say that you can easily make a paper template for this pattern and center punch for yourself. The guide just takes a ton of work out of the equation. The two lines of holes are four centimeters from each other and the spacing between the holes themselves is two centimeters. And if I have time before the video goes out, I'll even make a principal template and add it to the resources page over on the site. Okay, now that I've got my pilot holes in place, I need to drill to receive the actual inserts. I started by getting a first center bit that was wider than the flange of my inserts. There are a bunch of different flange shapes out there, but they're all roughly the same diameter, somewhere around 18 to 20 mil. A drill press with a depth stop would be the absolute best way to go here, but I wanted to show you guys that a real garage build is possible, so I'm going to attempt to do this with a hand drill. Maybe, maybe not the best idea. At first, I tried this technique where you use masking tape to give yourself a sort of depth indication of how deep you need to drill to. But it turns out that method doesn't, doesn't really play nice with forcing our bits. The edges of the bits are conical and the chips had nowhere to eject from, so my tape quickly became more trouble than it was worth. Instead, I just went slow, took my time, and eyeballed it. It just happened to be that the cutting tooth of my bit was sort of a convenient reference for about how deep I needed to go, so I just, I just went with that. And hey, for hand drilling, I think that actually came out pretty good. Next, I've got to drill for the threaded sections of the inserts. And at first, I tried using a twist bit. Ah, oh, dude, chunking out. Ah, that's no good. But, eh, holy hell, that made a huge mess of things. I don't know if my bit is dull or what, but I do know I can do better than that. I'm not too concerned about the strength here. This whole area is gonna be glassed and flooded with resin, so it'll be plenty strong. But let's see if we can't get some nicer looking results. And to do that, I switched over to a second, smaller Forstner bit. These guys take a little longer than a twist or spade bit to cut their hole, but they're specifically designed to leave a really nice, clean edged hole. And yeah, look at that. That's just much nicer. And I bet if I'd used my drill press, we'd be looking at even cleaner results, the kind of thing that might be approaching what you could see from a CNC router. For not using precision tools, I'm pretty proud of this outcome. And uh, let me just double check. Ah. Yep, the inserts pop right into place. Nice. So there you have it, the ice bug drilling guide and the easiest, cleanest set of binding inserts that I've drilled so far. So yeah, pretty stoked on this thing and pretty stoked that I managed to find a supplier for these locating pins. I was stuck on that for months. And I like the way these work so much, I would not be surprised if eventually these made their way over to future versions of the Scarab guide. The dual locking thing is just, it's just so pleasant to work with. And, uh, and they're also stronger than the, the printed versions, so benefits all around. If you want to grab one for yourself, there's a link down below. I'll try to get that paper template out too. Buying stuff from the shop is one of the best ways to support the channel. So if you can, I love you. 
but I also know what it's like to be broke. So I'm trying to help you out either way. Next up in this build, I'm gonna be laying out the shape of my board on the base sheet, and I am going 100% old school on that. No computers. It's gonna be really interesting. So I'm stoked to show you guys how I plan on doing that, but I also have my eye on further steps in the process, and I actually have a question for you. I was planning on doing wooden sidewalls for this build, because that's relatively accessible and it's something where you don't need special material. It's the kind of thing where just like if you were to do ABS sidewalls, you take strips and after you've profiled your core, you glue the strips in a way that's bent along the edges. But looking at my core, I'm not sure I need to. The outer edges of my core are already walnut and I'm really not sure what mechanical differences there would be if I just laminated more walnut on the side. Unless I'm super careful with my wood selection and like rive the staves to make my sidewalls out of, I'm gonna end up with some exposed end grain either way, which a good finish should take care of. So maybe I can just use my core as is and skip that step entirely. This will all be a new process for me. So I'm asking here, I'm asking on some of the board building communities and uh, you know, hopefully by the time I have to tackle that step, I will have learned a thing or two. So if you're interested in seeing that and a ton of other awesome DIY board sport stuff, just go ahead and subscribe. And speaking of board sport communities, I'm doing a test run of a Discord channel with the supporters on Patreon right now. If you'd like to get in on the ground floor and help develop and shape a community where we get to talk about the craft of building boards of all different kinds, eventually it'll be open to the public, but if you wanna check it out and kinda of have a say in how things are run, maybe consider joining these guys. The help is so appreciated. So that's gonna be it for this week, a new tool in the arsenal, and next week I'm gonna go all Archimedes on this board shape and use some really old techniques to make some pretty precise, pretty precise shapes. So I'm pretty excited about it. As always, I love having you guys along for the ride. So until next time, I'll see you soon. So I'm stoked to show you guys how I plan on doing that, but I also have my... I didn't think I had service out here. Go figure. Hopefully that was good. It did record, which is what we like to see.